Hey everybody, uh, Daily Grindhouse is here down at Fantastic Fest. What day are we on? Three. Three, three, I think it's three. Is it Saturday? Is it Saturday? I am here with the team behind Sweet, Sweet, Lonely Girl. Uh, you guys want to introduce yourselves to the uh, audience, please? Uh, I'm Quinn Shepard. I'm Aaron Willamy. And I'm A.D. Calvo. One thing, I, I saw the movie yesterday, I dug it, and one thing I really loved about it was the 70s aesthetic uh, that you were going for, and I believe it was a period piece set in the 70s. Uh, why was that important to you to do with this movie? Um, well, I grew, that's kind of when I fell in love with horror films, so it's a beautiful, you know, there's so many awesome films during that time, and um, the film is... Um, takes place kind of during the uh, Reagan-Carter uh, debate, and there's some subtext about stealing and how we kind of slowly slip into, uh, lose our moral ground over time, sometimes a little bit at a time. And I thought the introduction of Reaganomics uh, was a good kind of background. At the, be the beginning of big business, big pharma, um, and uh, taking from those that need. And not necessarily um, uh, in a malevolent way. You know, I, that's what I find evil fascinating in the way sometimes it's just little moral slips and we become used to doing a little bit and then a little bit more and uh, uh, before you know it. Uh, there was a terrific line along that. I can't remember what it was, um, while, she was while she was watching the... Did you do, what was did the you, wait, did you do a bad thing? For a good reason, yeah. you do the wrong thing for the right reason. Yeah, which what, 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 terrific lie. You do the wrong thing for the right reason. Yes, exactly. So we also have Aaron and Quinn here. Who now? You obviously were not around in the '70s when uh, AD was coming up on horror movies. Did you guys do any research watching? Uh, did you watch any of these classics that he was referring to? Uh, and which one? Oh, if so, which ones were your favorites? Yeah, at our first uh, table read, Alex gave us a list of a lot of movies that were references for the film, and we kind of took it upon ourselves to have some great film history lessons from it. Um, I remember I really loved Three Women, which was uh, a really interesting female-driven psychological film from the 70s, very moody. And I think some of the pool scenes in Sweet Lonely Girl are evocative of that. Um, and then we also watched some modern films as well. I really loved, uh, we watched My Summer of Love, which was for more of the romantic aspect. So just overall, a lot of really incredible reference films. Uh, for me, the Match Factory Girl, is that what yeah, it's called? Yeah. That one was really helpful as far as um, seeing where he was inspired and, and what to do, that, how to create this character that's so lonely but n is suddenly so easily m sort of uh, affected by someone like Beth. Um, and also Heavenly Creatures is another yeah, one we Peter watched. And, yeah. um, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. And Persona, and that was yeah. kind of... Yeah, mm -hmm. Persona, Mike Ryan, our producer, he had me watch Persona when he saw um, we were trying to capture that uh, female doubling tale. And he said, well, you really should watch Persona. I mean, that's probably the first one, Ing Ingmar Bergman. Uh, and, and it was beautiful. And there's a very uh, uh, a scene that stood out in my mind in that film, which was uh, takes place on a beach. And it's kind of this confession between the two women, and so we have a scene in our film that's very much inspired and a tip of the hat to that. Film. Um, my man Jason Kaufman, one of our, my favorite writers over at Daily Grindhouse, is, is working lighting for us in a way. Uh, Jason, I understand you had a question for the, uh, the team. Oh, uh, it, was, it was just a little more, um, the, the, the sort of like 70s like psychodrama and like the psychotic women quote unquote thing has been, uh, there's been several of those over the last few years. Uh, like uh, Alex Ross Perry, Queen of Earth, um, Darling that played here last year. And they all take a, like a kind of a different tack and sort of approach it from different angles. And uh, something I was going to ask you about, um, I don't know if you use them for reference or not, but Sweet Sweet Lonely Girl reminded me a lot of like early 70s uh, regional horror, like, um, like, I, like Don't Look in the Basement almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what's funny about Don't Look in the Basement? It was very concrete and ingrained in my mind for the longest time, and I couldn't remember what movie it was. 
and I like lost it. I keep asking people and telling them a little bit about the movie, kind of like what your dad with uh, uh, with um, little girl who lives, down, lives the down the lane. Oh yeah, that's another yeah. great yeah. one. We play. We have a nod to that. So I'm at Fantastic Fest last year, and I walk and I see a poster they have downstairs, but don't look in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> and I like see some of the images, and I'm like, holy shit! So I went home and like <laughs> sought it out, and it was the movie, it's and it, it was like I, I was oh so. Man happy to find it again. Well, yeah, it's funny because like so many like growing up on VHS and cable like you'd see something there was no way you can't search an image online. You can't it's this movie that saw this and you just <laughs> hope that you come across it one day. So, uh, I really dug uh, the wardrobe. Did you girls get to keep any of the 70s stuff? Oh yeah. I have I have it all. I mean, I wore some of it to the festival, but yeah, I have it all like in my closet preserved. I yeah. love it. Yeah, our costume designer, Jamie, what was her last name? Uh, Villa, Villa, Jamie Villa. Villa. Jamie Villa. Villers. Yeah. She was incredible, and she, yeah, we got to keep quite a few of the things. <laughs> the, the, co the costume design was great. I also really dug the music. Like, you had some of my favorite AM pop hits down there, the Classics 4 tune and Moonlight uh, by Starbuck. And uh, I, d I wasn't familiar enough with the Rod Stewart tune, but I, I recognize him. Those are some pretty big draws. Uh, and I know you mentioned in the Q&A the other day that you know you had some connections that got it, uh, but I was interested in how you got them as well as why you chose those songs. Yeah, well, I wanted the, the soundtrack to span from the 70s right up until 1980. Um, so the earliest one is the Rod Stewart, Handbags and Glad Rags. And what I love about that song is his voice is so iconic, even though people don't necessarily know the song. I knew exactly who it was as soon as I heard it. Right? So he's amazing like that. And, and then the last song is the Lover Boy song, uh, which take us r takes us right into 1980. So it's kind of uh, um, uh, just trying to span the decade. And also it goes in hand, hand in hand with the Carter Reagan thing, too, a little bit. Oh, Totally, leaving kind of that, you know, the 60s and 70s behind and as we move into a whole new world in the 80s. Um, uh, but uh, uh, obviously I would look for tonally, first, first the, the, the early cut had like dream songs, like th they weren't all available. <laughs> so then it's a matter of looking through what's available that matches the tone. Sure. And then trying to find even if you even lyrics. if you fell in love with the temp track totally totally and then and then lyrics and then the score too was uh, tried to evoke a lot of um, uh, films of that era. There's a piece that is I think a very r reminiscent of the Carrie theme when she, uh, Adele sits at the piano, mm -hmm. and um, then we have some stuff that is very much a tribute to the Robert Altman films, uh, the orchestral stuff in the third act. Absolutely. Pizzicata, I think they call it, that, that instrument. Yes. Um, uh, and then, uh, and then some synths from that that era too. We used the Blade Runner synth. Uh, when you mentioned that the, you mentioned that the other day, and I love you just call it the Blade Runner synth, and everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. Joe Carano, our composer, audio mixer, dialogue editor, foley artist. I have like one magic sound guy. Uh, he has a collection of vintage synths and. He told me the name of the synth he used for the Blade Runner. I can't remember it. Uh, the house. Um, first of all, like, how did you come to find that location? And second of all, like, was it as like terrifying in real life as it looks in the movie? Because it looks, it looks uh, very scary. It was actually multiple houses. We shot in quite a few Victorian houses because the different floors were from different homes. Some of them were more scary than others. <laughs> some of the houses you walk in, be like, oh, this one's kind of quaint. And then some of them you'd walk in, you'd be like, okay, this is like, you know, it's interesting, you know, because of course you're in that atmosphere of, you know, ghost stories and thinking about it. So all of a sudden everything's a lot more ominous than yeah, maybe it would sure. be normally. You'd just be like, oh, nice architecture. We're like haunted. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, yeah, they were really beautiful. Yeah, the, the first, the, the main picture of the house that you, that you know about, <laughs> that you see, is the the first floor and all of the the furnishings is is all there and um, I think that was just incredible to walk in and be like we get to use all of this yeah. that's already here. Um. Yeah, and and as Quinn pointed out, we did have to split the location up. Um, they were very generous. The people that owned the big house on the hill, I think it might have been used in a Disney movie once too. Really? Yeah, uh, I remember hearing something about that. So anyway, it's Vernon, Connecticut, Rockville section. Uh, it's this beautiful uh, town with a lot of Victorian homes. 
uh, and his family was very generous and let us film downstairs, but they were still living in the house. So we, we said that we would keep out of their second floor where they would you know, continue to live their lives and, and we needed to find another house to match, uh, a s create a fictitious second floor for it. And then we needed a kitchen that felt like a period kitchen. We used yet another house that was abandoned. So we were jumping around. I remember very early on, I think I brought you to all of them. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted you to have an, an, a, a mental image of Adele's house. Well, I'm noticing that just th through the interview and hanging out with you guys a little bit that you two were as into the production and the writing and like the making the movie come to fruition not just from an acting point of view, but from the concept, it seems, even though you wrote and directed it, right? Well, we have Alex to thank for that because from day one, he was you know, open to any kind of feedback that he felt we felt about our characters, if we wanted to change a line to phrase it a different way. I mean, he was very open to that. It was such a collaborative process. Yeah, really open. Alex is an amazingly open director and so kind and so warm. And so every day on set, it was just about playing with things and seeing what we liked and experimenting and trying stuff and it was just a great experience. Uh, now, uh, you've worked in genre before. Uh, have you uh, ladies worked in genre before? And if so or if not, do uh, you plan on maybe doing some more horror or sci-fi or stuff along those lines? Ooh, I've done a little bit of genre. I was on a show where I did a lot of screaming, getting tied up, tortured. <laughs> I was on a Hostages. I was going to say, is that the Price is Right? <laughs> no. No, I was on a show called Hostages, which was a, a thriller, and so I spent a lot of time as a victim, but I, I prefer to play the villain, and so I'd say if I do a lot of genre work in the future, I think it's more fun to be, you know. More fun to play the bad guy? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And this is my first experience, really, with genre, but I then did um, The Crucible on Broadway, which was kind of a broad uh, genre on in theater, yeah, sort of, um, which was really, <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really fun, and I got a lot out of it, and he was at my opening night, um, but, you know, I love that kind of being in a, immersed into a, a genre like this. It's you going back to genre as well? Uh, yeah, I love genre. Uh, I left it because I was doing all this plot-driven fluff. No, I, lo I love those films. <laughs> I'm very self-critical, but I wasn't like, my films weren't coming out, they weren't coming out the way that, uh, the, the 70s movies that I love. And I like, that's when I hooked up with Mike Ryan and he recalibrated my writing to just focus more on character-driven stuff. And I feel much m better now. And I'm, so I'm still learning and still growing. And, I and this movie's a nice mix of character and uh, genre because, um, without revealing too much, without the third act, it's still a, it's still a very engrossing tale. Like, I mean, everybody who I've talked to down here doesn't, we're like, I don't know where it was going. And <laughs> then it went there and it was cool. Well, thank you. It's, it's very minimally plotted. Um, and I think you can take a, a viewer along for a ride just by engaging with a character in their life. And uh, you become more immersed in the narrative. Another thing we did, um, I'm very open to pulling things out and changing the script as we go along. Uh, I think narratively we might have like pulled apart, like if you have a structure when you're putting, putting up a building, we like in editorial shifted some things around and intentionally pulled some, some beams out of the Jenga power <laughs> so that the narrative is more subjective and can be interpreted by each person a little differently as opposed to projecting such a uh, this is the story, yeah. and it's about yeah. this, and it's like we, it's tiring. I, I want it to it'll help. More. It'll help work with repeat viewings too, because you might take a little bit out of it each time. Totally. Yeah, because I'm looking forward to seeing this one again. And uh, let me say, a 77 minute runtime. Yeah. Oh, that's a. I mean, was that intentional? I mean, because some movies, like Hollywood movies, are all two hours and 15 minutes this day, and a lot of my reviews are always, well, it was pretty good, but you could have cut about 20 minutes out of that. So my feeling with that is with low budget films. Uh, the, sh the shorter script is key because it gives you, lets you shoot more pages per day in a limited schedule. I also think these, these smaller films, um, it's harder to hold people's attention on, on lower budgets. And I think the shorter run times, especially with today, people have seem to be yeah. not have enough time for anything. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Well, we're going to wrap things up. Uh, I do want to ask my one question I ask everybody at Fantastic Fest. It's obviously we're upstairs where all the karaoke rooms 
what is your karaoke song of choice? What's the one that you can, when, when you get forced to do it, even if you don't do it, you're like, all right, I can handle that one. Uh, Sweet Transvestite from Rocky Horror. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh my God, mine's so different. Uh, uh, so, uh, Summer Nights from Greece. I usually meet that, a guy do it with me. That's really not that different. Oh, okay. uh, two of my favorite musicals. <laughs> um, probably your song by Elton John. So. Oh, very nice. Very cool. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, sweet, sweet, lonely girl. Uh, when are we going to get to see it outside of Fantastic Fest? Do we know? So we're going, it's playing at Sitges uh, in like two weeks in Spain. So if you're in Barcelona, please drop by <laughs> and we'll drink some cava together. Oh, that sounds like a blast. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to get out of here. Thanks a lot, guys and girls. Appreciate it.